As I talk about patriarchy in this video, I want to make sure it's understood that I'm kind of talking about two different things. On the one end, there's the patriarchy, as in the oppressive social system of gender-based dominance by men. But at the same time, but also separate, is this image of the familial patriarch, as in a male leader of a community or a household. It's important to make this distinction because too often we forget that everyone hasn't read Judith Butler, right? Because what a lot of people that haven't read Judith Butler see is that black men are missing from their families and communities and those communities suffer without them and those women and children are left to fend on their own. During World War I, the city of East St. Louis, Illinois, which is about an hour drive from Chicago, became an economic boomtown as the factory work in support of war sprung up and offered solid, well-paying work to everyone who could lift a hammer. Well, almost everyone, of course, black workers were still greatly excluded from these work opportunities, only really given a chance to work after labor and union disputes with factory owners. And this is because the factory owners would often use black workers who they could pay lower wages to to break strikes, forcing the all white unions to fold on their demands. Of course, these unions could have made themselves stronger and got a better position if they'd have allowed black people to join them in the first place. but. That's too much like right. In the summer of 1917, a labor dispute started another round of this dance. And on May 28th, a meeting of some 1000 all white male union workers turned ugly as the frustration of the labor dispute spurred these men into action as black workers were again hired as union busters. Black workers who again were not invited to these labor unions in the first place. So why don't you guess what this angry white mob did? Did they recognize the universal plight of the proletariat, disregard race as so many leftists in my comments tell me I should do all the time, collect together with their black comrades to overthrow the exploitative bourgeoisie class factory owners and seize the means of production? Or did they riot? Did they go to the closest black town and start attacking people? Did they start a riot that lasted at least three days and left somewhere between 40 and 100 African-Americans dead and at least a thousand homeless after their fires burned many homes to the ground? If you guessed B, congratulations, you know your history. Good job, Critical Race Theory. Critical Race Theory. It's basically just history. If you saw my Edgelord video, then you know that I've already touched on the fact that this and Tulsa and Rosewood and so on were not unique. Due to shows like Watchmen and Lovecraft Country, the awareness of what racial terrorism was really about in this country in the 1900s is much higher these days, but Tulsa is just the tip of the iceberg. According to a study done in 1965, which is when a lot of these are still going on, this study counted 76 events that would be considered race riots from 1914 to 1964. And many of these events had the exact same characteristics. Black folks were getting too close to accessing quality work and a decent life in too close proximity to white people. And racial tensions eventually ensued and an inciting incident, which is usually some accusation of a black man talking to a white woman, caused a riot. And then suddenly black bodies started piling up and black houses started burning down. A talking point you've probably heard from conservatives is that after the rise of liberalism and feminism and the welfare state, yada, 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 after the Civil Rights Act, essentially of 1964, that black people suddenly gave up on the American dream and that before then black people and black families were stronger and black folks still worked hard and all kinds of other bullshit. What really happened is that for nearly a century after slavery, black folks across the country built and rebuilt community after community over and over again. And like the Reapers from Mass Effect, that's a really good reference, look it up. Like the Reapers from Mass Effect, as soon as these communities got to a high enough status, a lot of them were burned down. 
Once they became too prosperous, too autonomous, too good for black folks in the eyes of their white neighbors, numerous mechanisms of white supremacy would come through and destroy them, whether it be over policing or racist urban planning that built lakes and highways through some of these communities or just good old fashioned guns and Molotov cocktails. At some point in time, so many of these communities met abrupt and unnatural ends. And the thing is that still didn't stop a lot of black people. So a lot of black people just kept it pushing, but many, many did decide if the game is rigged, why are we still playing? Why should I keep running in a race where you will break my legs as soon as I start to get in front? I bring up this story to kind of couch us in the precarious nature that is work for black people and specifically for black men, because I do this in response to the ongoing, you know, trending topic that is the I don't dream of labor topic. Many people might think that this is just some new Gen Z or millennial shit, but I would argue that this entire concept probably originated with black people in the post-industrial era of the 1920s. I feel like that's probably when a large swath of black people or specifically black men, like it's settled into them that no matter what they did, no matter how hard they worked, the price required to lead a decent life in this country was not worth the effort if it meant working with or under white people. This was, again, not all black people or black men. And I'll get to the other side of this in a second. But I want to kind of talk about this because as I began to hear about this discourse, something about it didn't sit right. I won't retread all of the I don't dream of labor details. There are a lot of videos out there. My suggestion is that if you want to get like the full scope of it, that you check out for Harriet's video that came out a couple of weeks ago for Harriet is a black uh, I won't call her video essays because her videos are straight up like lectures and seminars. They're very direct, very informational and very comprehensive and excellent. So please check her out. Um, and so she did one a few weeks ago that I thought really was a great summation of the many pieces of what this topic is. In short, though, the I don't dream of labor discussion revolves around a few core concepts. One, work sucks, especially modern work life sucks. Two, the way that we've been trained to think about and idealize work is manipulative and steeped in capitalism. And three, the videos will usually give you some type of idea or, you know, call to action as to how you might disengage from the modern work life, usually ending with you should start your own YouTube channel. On the surface, it's a cool discussion as a concept. And in terms of like those core tenets, I don't see anything wrong with it. And it's probably getting a lot of traction because so many older and younger millennials and older Gen Z's have been working in the modern workplace and we realize that it's kind of shitty. Some legit jewels are being dropped in this discussion. All these issues about labor reform and workers' rights, it, it, these are huge issues that are starting to play out in real life. Right now, a lot of companies on, you know, white collar, high end jobs, all the way down to, you know, baristas and people that work at McDonald's, people are finding it difficult to find folks that want to work. And that's a big deal. But as I often notice, the discourse is missing some things. Some have already pointed out that a lot of it sounds like it comes from a place of privilege. And there's definitely some lack of intersectionality, especially along racial and class lines. So folks have touched on this, but I don't think they've really illustrated this. One thing to say, this is a gap and it's another thing to try to fill that gap. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. So I want to enter into the discourse, a perspective that I'm not seeing on this topic, which is the precarious space and like concept of work, especially as it pertains to black men and how that intersects with areas of identity and class and status. What are black men's experiences working under capitalism, under white supremacy? And how do those experiences alter across race or how are they unique to black men in the first place? Why do I think that black men have not been dreaming of labor for a long time? What rationale do I have for that argument? I mean, we can start with the fact that the whole term hustle culture that's definitely us. And so, and of course, in the spirit of Pat Hill Collins, I'm going to be doing this by pulling at examples of media. So folks that's been here with me for the longest, get ready for some nostalgia. And my new audience members, prepare for a bunch of black movies you've maybe never seen or heard of before. And just, you're welcome. Before we get to the hustlers though, we have to start by paying respect to the many black men who never quit the game 
who never had to dream of labor because they were always already there doing it. They're far more abundant than racist stereotypes might have you think. In fact, they're so abundant and working so hard that is actually kind of killing them on some occasions. The amount of black men and minorities killing themselves via work is so bad that they actually came up with a term for it called John Henryism. John Henryism is a public health sociological term that's meant to describe the propensity for certain men to respond to like high stress, high strain, high demand work with renewed effort and a complete ignorance of the fact that this work is killing them, which leads to them dying. A lot like John Henry. And I'm sorry, y'all, I don't fuck with John Henry. John Henry is a shitty folktale. I knew this when I was a kid, but when I watched the new Disney version of this folktale that came out in 2000 with my children a couple of years ago, I was not ready for the way it was going to horrify me. For those who may be unaware, like American folktales are like most other folktales around the world, I'm sure, in that they involve telling a story of a mythological person who may or may not have existed, but because of something that they did, they became a matter of, you know, folklore. And added to that lore is usually some type of cultural, moral, or some type of piece of Americana that is meant to speak to the values of what it means to be an American. So you have stuff like Paul Bunyan, Pecos Bill, the Headless Horseman, Ronald Reagan, and of course, John Henry. But what makes Henry unique is, for one, he is the only of like the numerous African-American folktales that are out there to be fully put in the American canon. And part of that is because he so perfectly embodies what we believe American exceptionalism truly is. He works well as a symbol of dogged determination and fighting against social injustice and just the idea of what America is. You work hard and you pull yourself up from the bootstraps and all that good stuff that we get. That's John Henry. He's been a fixture in America for over a hundred years. And to a lot of little black boys, he's their first black superhero. Not my sons though, fuck that. In the Disney version of this movie, Henry follows all the typical parts of the story. He was born with a hammer in his hand. He's strong as shit, but he's also strong of will and character. But they also add a wife, which is like, you know, fine. It's not in the versions of the story that I remember as a kid or the ones I could find, but I'm not so cynical as to be bothered by that part. That addition is cool. But then it goes left, literally. The railroad workers that John Henry is a part of get into a labor dispute with the corporation that is trying to put the rail down because this corporation has finally created their super train nailing machine and they're gonna save on labor by firing everybody that had contracts with. And these motherfuckers revolt. This is it, this is Karl Marx's dream of the workers uprising, seize the means of production and wait, wait, John, 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 what are you doing? So John Henry stops the riot and finger wags at the people looking to do what they probably should have done. And then he goes super saiyan and he makes a contest and then he dies in the process. And the movie, because they added a wife, also had to add a son. So the last image that we see is John Henry's widow and her bastard son as they just sing Negro spirituals and prepare to try to survive in the Reconstructionist South alone. The end. My cynicism here is not just in the fact that he dies, that the first image of idealized black masculinity for many black boys is martyred in the name of American exceptionalism, but also that these tweaks I just make it even worse because it it illustrates how shitty of a situation this is. And truthfully, much of this can be extrapolated to men of any race. But glorifying the sacrifice of John Henry for the sake of everyone else, while he leaves his widow and his son in a cruel world to survive on their own, 
That shit bothers me. It is completely unnecessary and it evokes a legacy of selfless, magical Negro characters in the media that are willing to sacrifice themselves for America and innocent white people. And that's a whole nother video. The idea that a man should aspire to work spans race in this country, but the complication of black men is that we often don't get access to this role or when we do, we might end up like John Henry trying to keep up. But regardless, the pressure that a lot of black men feel to be one of the good ones makes this type of sacrifice reasonable in their minds. And I don't disrespect that at all. Henry represents the ideal image of black American exceptionalism and benevolent patriarchy. And TV and media over the years has given us plenty of images of black patriarchs who fit the John Henry mold but don't fully like engage with the very real consequences of what this type of dedication means. As I talk about patriarchy in this video, I wanna make sure it's understood that I'm kind of talking about two different things. On one end, there's the patriarchy, as in the oppressive social system of gender-based dominance by men, but at the same time, but also separate, is this image of the familial patriarch, as in a male leader of a community or a household. In the idealized classical American view, patriarchs provide stability and protection for their families and communities. I've talked about this before, but to bring it up again, to attain this status as a black man is highly valuable because it's something that we know we're not supposed to be able to get. And it's something that a lot of black men aspire to, regardless of what the rhetoric or the stories about black men you hear is research based that many black men do aspire to fulfill this role. And again, I don't mean that role in terms of holding gendered power to oppress people in their family or in their communities, although we know that happens. I mean, just being able to play that classic male role in a family or community. It's important to make this distinction because too often we forget that everyone hasn't read Judith Butler, right? For a lot of black people, this is including black men and women, they experience a lot of barriers to having that role be available for them in their families and communities. And by associating patriarchy all the time with the negative outcomes of gender-based power and violence, which is definitely a legitimate thing to do, we miss out on making sure that part of this conversation is clear to everyone in the audience. Because what a lot of people that haven't read Judith Butler see is that black men are missing from their families and communities and those communities suffer without them and those women and children are left to fend on their own, like John Henry's family. So anyway, if we are talking about benevolent black patriarchy in the media within that John Henry archetype, meaning that this is a person that works hard and toils, the first image that comes into my mind is Carl Winslow. Good old A cab Carl. Well, excuse me, Norma Ray. <laughs> look, Carl. No, you look. Now, if you want to play this little strike game with the kitties, it's okie dokie with me. But now, you're messing with the big kahuna. <laughs> Carl reveals one key feature to the John Henry archetype, which is that they demand respect from their household for the work that they put in to take care of their families. It isn't necessarily greatly demonstrative or toxic, although we know in real life that does happen sometimes, but it is a core factor to who they are. Carl doesn't work as hard as John Henry or other men that might fit into this section, but he does difficult work that hurts him to do. And, you know, without getting too far into the complications of policing and policing while black, they try to get into that. They don't always do it well. I mean, this is Family Matters in the 90s, but the fact that policing is hard for him, they make sure to show that and show that he does it for his family. For him, his hard work and toil provides for everyone around him, and that means that they should also heed and respect him as a leader. That's the patriarchal dividend after all. Things aren't always perfect with him and his family, but like they, along of course with Steve Urkel, who I managed not to mention, which is amazing. They see him as a pillar of their circle and they value his presence in their lives. And like, this is unique to that patriarchal status. Slightly opposed to this in another example is Terry Crews from Everyone Hates Chris. Crews as the patriarch in his family isn't as outwardly prideful as Carl Winslow. There's a definite air of dignity and reverence to the fact that he's able to keep the lights on essentially by himself 
but his household, like a lot of black households is egalitarian to low key matriarchal and ran by his wife, Rochelle, played by Tashina Arnold. Despite their relatively meager means, Rochelle takes a lot of pride in the fact that she can depend on her husband's hard work to keep their household afloat. My man has two jobs. Check, please. Now, do I look like I have your check? All I'm hollering at people. I don't need this. My husband has two jobs. I don't need to be here right now. I do not need this. My husband has two jobs. I don't need this. My man has three jobs. As excessive as this scene, it underscores the precarious position that a lot of black women are in because of this historically problematic work reality for black men. Black women have never not worked in this country. And this is a point of contention between them and white feminists pretty much since forever. And part of this is because unless you found a John Henry, if you are a black woman, it wasn't possible for you to just be a housewife. And this has historically created gendered conflict between black men and black women in intimate partnerships. And that's something that persists to this day because the issues of work persist to this day. But generally speaking, the John Henry, he doesn't have this problem. Even in Julius's case, where it is low key matriarchal, there's seldom any angst about his role as a man in that household because it's understood and he has earned a level of respect. That's $2 on fire. In a capitalist patriarchy, everyone is still beholden to the social contract of gender. For men, if you stop dreaming of labor, become a nomad or a wandering musician or whatever, if you have a partner or children, that role of protector or provider that is assigned to masculine men, that doesn't go away. Society, your children, and very often your partner will still be looking for you to make something happen. I don't think this is very different for white men or any other race of men in America, but for black men who have the added baggage of how racism makes that less likely and then also colors even the men that are able to do it with negative stereotypes, it does change at least how that feels and works in practice. Hey, so here we are at the editing bay again for our standard editorial addendum section. Um, and I am talking to you here because I realized as I was going through editing that I maybe didn't do the best job of referring to some of the more significant, like actual explicit research that's out there that talks about workplace discrimination. Now, I feel like the normal people, I feel like most people who are normal don't have to be convinced that there is discrimination as it pertains to work and race in this country. Um, however, one, I know that I, I've garnered uh, more attention recently, and some of that attention has been from, I'll say, bad faith actors. And those bad faith actors won't change their mind regardless of what research I present, but I still think it's useful to at least engage a little bit in some things. So I'll probably drop a couple of studies in the description, but I want to talk about one in particular that's really famous in the social sciences, which is a study from one diva pager. And this study is seminal because it's one of the few field experiments that you'll see in the social sciences. The social sciences are notorious for being soft sciences. When the social sciences disagree with people's worldviews. They want to discredit it as not a real science, but you know, that's neither here nor there. That's a whole nother video. This particular study though is unique because it's a field experiment. So this is an empirically driven, not just in the methods, but also in the actual methodology. What they did was they took two resumes and they made the resumes identical in every way, except they gave one resume a white name like, I don't know, Jack Reacher. And then they gave the other resume a black sounding name like Lamar Jackson or something. And the only other factor is that as they put in resumes, they made distinctions between which people applying were convicted felons and which people applying were not. And what they found was that black American men were less likely to get callbacks based on these resumes without criminal records as white men with criminal records. Now, I'm not here to say that having a criminal record should mean that you don't get a job and bullshit like that. But considering the common themes that society tries to throw out there about why certain people, certain populations, certain races don't get access to jobs, the idea that a white man with no criminal record is more qualified on paper just off their whiteness than a black man with no criminal record should tell you something about how much race plays into who gets access to work 
who gets access to economic capital and all these other resources and who does not. This study has thousands of citations, has been repeated in numerous ways, and it's part of a legacy, a history at this point of studying this phenomenon of workplace discrimination for people of color. And so as not to get further off course, I just want to make sure that that paper in particular was discussed because it undergirds the reality of why this whole hustler dynamic is a thing. It's because opportunities for straight line work are sparse. And when they do become a real thing, like the discrimination doesn't go away. Like if you are a black guy that gets a job and whether you have a name like Derek or Daquan, the discrimination that you had to get through to get the job doesn't just leave once you're in there. It keeps happening. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of men find other ways to make money as to preserve their humanity. And yeah, that's 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 it for that. So back to the video. But so many men still do it and like they need their roses. However, these images of black men playing as John Henry undermines the reality that for a lot of black men, historically honest work, especially under or with white people, has always been a precarious venue through which black men can attain the resources needed to take care of themselves or their families. Sure, work is always available, but aside from the usual exploitation, black men can be assured that they will face mistreatment, limited opportunity, and far more scrutiny for their work compared to their white counterparts. And this is where the hustler is born. I'm a, I'm a hustler, yeah. homie, I'm a hustler. And why the hustle has always been a thing for black men. So when we look at the media, I could be wrong, but a cursory glance that I gave kind of researching this I feel like the hustler image for black men in media is maybe a little overrepresented. This may just be, you know, the fact that there's a long standing love affair with tricksters and role characters, but there's also definitely some uncomfortable stereotypes in play. But even if we we're only to look at respectable hustlers, like hustlers that aren't wild caricatures of blackness, we'd still see a lot of examples. The range of this archetype can be easily seen in the prolific career of channel favorite Eddie Murphy. Like 75% of all Eddie Murphy's characters are in this hustle archetype. In Trading Places, he plays Billy Ray Valentine, and Billy Ray Valentine pulls greatly upon the tradition of Anansi the Spider, which is a, another African folktale, who often starts his trickster ways because somebody else tried to fuck with him, and that's what happened in Trading Places. It's another one of those comedies from, this isn't even the 90s, this is the 80s. So again, people in my audience, it's a different time frame, but you should know that by now. Then he pulls the same exact act like 10 years later in The Distinguished Gentleman, where he plays a con man congressman from what state? You know it's Florida. And he uses his con men act and the trickster stuff and the hustler ethic to get to Capitol Hill. But even when the character's not a con man, Murphy still uses that same routine to be a cop on like three or four different occasions in his movies. But all of the cops, they're slick talking, they're witty, they think on their feet, they're strategic. That is the essence of the black hustle. Hey, hey, I'm sorry I'm late, but I run into this broad. You're the fucking guy with the truckload of cigarettes that day. Remember I told you about it? I told the cops you some buffalo. I thought that was you, man. You almost got busted. I did get busted. I lost my whole investment because of you. Vinny, what the hell is wrong with you, man? You know I'm a businessman. I got to work. What? You, you want to do business or what? I have the money and I do want to do business, but with you, I ain't doing nothing in front of this dude because this dude is a cop. I know when I can smell a pig inside the room. I used to be a Muslim, man, and I know that's Park over here. And then, yes, Park. It's definitely Park. I ain't doing shit around this dude, man. You want to do business? You know where to find me. Fuck you, man. Like, Allahu Akbar. You calling me a cop? Come here, come here. My favorite example for this with Eddie Murphy comes from Dolomite Is My Name, which is a bio pick on the life of Rudy Ray Moore and Rudy Ray Moore himself is one of the original tricksters of black comedy that pulls upon the traditions of a Nazi the spider and the movie is about him against all odds getting a movie made it's this really triple layered meta narrative because it's Eddie Murphy who is well known as a comedian who played this trickster hustler character that is also well known for using his real life hustler tendencies to make sure that everybody on his team gets paid. Other black young comedians get to be in his movies like Martin Lawrence, Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, so many black comedians that you can think of. The only person that hasn't gotten a chance is Kevin Hart. And that's because by the time Kevin Hart was out, Eddie Murphy was like chilling, but he's always done that. He plays Rudy Ray Moore, who did the same thing and is Rudy Ray Moore trying to get a movie made where he is trying to get all of these black 
actors and producers and directors to get a lane because the whole black exploitation like that all came about because black people weren't allowed to do what they wanted to do in actual Hollywood. They were only playing butlers and slaves. And so they were like, look, we're also hustlers. I'm a, I'm a hustler, yeah. homie, I'm a hustler. And then Rudy Ray Moore puts his people on, but like the movie is full of black actors in real life that weren't working. So it's like triple layer, I don't know, it's, it's good. Just go watch it, it's a great movie regardless. I wanna be clear that as I talk about hustlers, like we're not talking about just criminals. That I know is the image that you probably started with when I said black men know how to hustle, but the hustler is an innovator. He's a businessman. He is strategic. He's resourceful. And please believe that even though it doesn't look like the work that John Henry does, hustling is still very hard work. And yes, from the 1920s on, there were numbers men and pimps and you know crooks and drug dealers. Like that's still a thing, but there were also club owners, grocers, barbers, musicians, these men that didn't dream of labor and did exactly what that meme says you're supposed to do. They figured out a skill and they went into business on their own. That is how a lot of these black communities were built. They were built around enterprising black people, black men and women who said, I'm tired of dealing with the shit that white people are doing to me in these communities and cities. I'm gonna go somewhere where it's just us and we're gonna make it happen. But as you know, the aforementioned history of racial terrorism kicks in and along with the progression of capitalism to consolidate wealth among a small few, this made appropriate forms of hustling less and less possible as time went on and fewer and fewer opportunities to create autonomous work, to create you know, legal hustles were viable. And here it's important to recognize that the challenge of either being indigent and working in racist and exploitative roles, this wasn't the end all be all. Radical black leftists of the 60s and 70s, most notably the Black Panthers, who were an explicitly socialist group, they made many attempts to address these issues. And the Panthers built on the socialist leanings and, and teachings of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. When we think of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, especially in like the sanitized versions that we get in the media, they usually leave that part out. But Martin Luther King wrote a lot on his socialist beliefs and Malcolm X didn't until he came back from his pilgrimage to Mecca, which is where he really changed a lot of his rhetoric. We don't hear too much from that part of the story. Socialists and leftist beliefs were not foreign to black people, and there were many above board attempts to engage in worker reform and action, and black people formed their own unions. And I don't know, for some reason, this shit just didn't work out. And then the FBI killed Martin Luther King. Bell Hooks talks about this in Be Real Cool. This is like my 10th time mentioning this book on this channel. It's only like 150 pages, people. Go read it. Um, a lot of black men recognize this. They were faced with the failures of revolution, which might have led to their death or the prospect of indignity and exploitation in the white man's workforce. And so they sought whatever way possible they could manifest capital without losing themselves in the process. And the reality is for a lot of these men, some form of manipulation of the system was all they had left. And by manipulation of the system, of course, I mean actual crime. I'm a, I'm a hustler, yeah. homie. I'm a hustler. This is romanticized somewhat in black media, but at the same time, like the way we look at crime, especially black crime, I mean, do I have to explain how problematic a lot of it is? I appreciate that it's humanizing. Like when we look at characters like Oscar Grant. Hey, I have to come in and correct myself real quick because I realized in speaking through this script that I made a grievous error of referring to Oscar Grant as a character as if to imply that he was not based on a real person. Oscar Grant was a real person that was murdered by the police while he was handcuffed and laying on his stomach after his police officer supposedly mistook a gun for a taser and shot him in the back. This actually kind of belies the point of how there's a very delicate function in line between dramatizing the real life struggle that lower income black men deal with in terms of surviving and putting that on screen for essentially entertainment purposes. And that on one end is a testament to the amazing artistry of Ron Coogler and Michael B. Jordan in bringing this person to life on screen and giving us an image of what his life was really like before he was murdered and the struggle he was 
going through, but that struggle being used as a dramatization of real life does have consequences, which in my opinion is sometimes taking away the real life stakes and reality for actual men who are living life like Oscar Grant, who are trying to balance surviving and recovering from a life of trauma with raising their own children and trying to support their own families in a hostile environment. So I just wanted to make sure that that was not mistaken as something that I did on purpose. That was essentially a flub and I apologize. And back to the show. When you look at Sincere from Belly and to a lesser extent, cause I don't know if he was actually committing a crime, but like Cash is Green from Sorry to Bother You, when you put a man in a situation or anybody in a situation of desperation, crime might happen. The thing that I think the media does here is empathize with what it's like to be in a situation where you're legitimately thinking about crime to take care of yourself. And the fact that the dominant society does not want to acknowledge that reality in America and in a lot of places in the world, we see crime as an aspect of morality. But as I've said before, when you study the social science behind crime, you recognize that crime and poverty, they go hand in hand. An example of this comes from a really shitty movie called Nothing to Lose. It stars Tim Robbins as a guy named Nick Beam and his life's turned upside down because he found his wife cheating on him. And then he goes like on a road rage trip and he runs into Martin Lawrence who plays this guy named T. Paul. It's, it's bad. The bottom line is T. Paul, AKA Martin Lawrence is a petty criminal and he meets Nick Beam because he's trying to rob him. Somehow they become friends and they go on an adventure. The 90s were weird. I don't know how many times I have to say that. But there's this scene towards the end of it where Nick Beam this entire time has been looking down upon Martin Lawrence's character because he's a criminal and that's what people do when they come from privilege and they don't understand the reality of what crime is. But when he gets to his house, he sees that T. Paul has a wife and two children and is even taking care of his own mother or mother-in-law, I'm not sure. And then he sees that that he did try somehow to better himself. And he has a certificate talking about engineering on the wall. And throughout the movie, they've been seeding the fact that T. Paul, despite being a petty criminal, knows a lot about electronics and engineering. And then you see this like table of rejection letters from him applying to jobs. So T. Paul, like a lot of black men in this situation, tries to do what America says poor people are supposed to do. He tries to lift himself up from the bootstraps, but that doesn't, hasn't ever fucking worked. The other thing this underscores is that this hustler lifestyle, especially as it starts to get into being illegal, it doesn't lead to solid and, you know, stable personal lives. It doesn't lead to effective fathering. It doesn't lead to being a good partner. You know, you don't see a hustler coming home from a life of hustling to a doting wife. There's too much hustling. Hustling, 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 hustling. I'm a, I'm a hustler, yeah. homie. I'm a hustler. What I'm getting at here and what I hope I'm getting at in general is that this concept of divesting from work as some type of a radical idea. I mean, on one end, black men have been doing it forever, but on the other end, it's a real oversimplification of what it means to need to work to survive. The John Henry is straight and narrow and stable, but costly. And the hustler has, you know, high risk, high reward and a very low floor. But the other thing that I think needs to be teased out is the fact that like, if the hustlers were all successful, wouldn't that just mean a lot more capitalism? The natural outgrowth of this movement from where I sit, no matter if it's men, women, black, Asian, white, whomever, participating in it is like basically creating more capitalists that use their ability to effectively divest from work to just put them on the other end of the bourgeoisie exploitation graph. That's what hustling is kind of all about. The image of the hustler, the sampled voice that I've been playing here this entire time, that's Jay-Z. Now tuned into the motherfucking greatest. Uh, 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 I'm a hustler, homie. You a customer crony. Got some dirt on my shoulder. Could you brush it off for me? Former drug dealer turned rapper, turned superstar, turned billionaire, mogul, Jay-Z, the patron saint of black capitalism, along with guys like Killer Mike and Charlamagne the God and Ice Cube. Like they all come from abject poverty and lack and they all scrape their way into significant economic power and capital. 
And in between, these people have been, you know, speaking the doctrine of black capitalism, that this is what black people and black men especially can use to lift themselves out of poverty. And like, be critical of that all you want. There's many reasons to cancel these men, right? Many reasons. But from my perspective, it's far more salient in black communities and among black circles than a lot of what I hear people talking about on the left. And that's greatly because unlike the left's like nebulous, never ending, one day we will seize the means of production, this directly engages with the reality of what oppressed people are going through. And that kind of brings me full circle to how this I don't dream of labor movement doesn't really work for me. It's just not inclusive of the reality for a lot of people that I see working or like needing work. And truth be told, from a leftist standpoint, it's really antithetical to, I think, the core ideologies of what the left is, no matter how far left you are. I'm of a dual nature here. Again, I don't like to label myself as a leftist, but I believe in socialist principles of class. I believe that work is inherently exploitative and no ethical consumption of the capitalism, all the good stuff, right? And I definitely don't believe in this bullshit mythology about having a dream job or finding a purpose, a life's purpose through work. I have no like desire to be a millionaire or living a fabulous, lavish lifestyle. But best believe, I am very much waiting on a call from Skillshare, Audible, Ridge Wallets, Adam and Eve. I do not fucking care. Your logo right here on my shirt, my forehead, right? I don't fucking care. If you want that pure leftist socialist vibe with your black red tubers, I suggest the storyteller and St. Andrewism. Those dudes are legit. Those young boys have read all the books. They have a finger on the pulse of all the stuff. And maybe they'll come through and, and you know, like ream me out over this. So like, check them out. I don't know. Maybe it's too late for me because the way I feel, my children are one generation removed from being born into abject poverty. Like they are a health calamity in myself or my wife from a completely different opportunity structure than the one that we've built for them up until this point. And that is the reality of most workers in this world, in this country. As of recording, YouTube does not pay my bill. But even when it is, you'll never hear me talk as if what I'm doing here on screen is some type of a radical act of work you know, reform or socialist resistance, nor will I ever advocate for others to do the same thing or quit their jobs and become YouTubers. Because I know full well, if you look at like my videos and like how I've gotten here, this shit wasn't easy. And I didn't get to this spot because I worked so hard. It's because I'm talented and I got lucky. Shout out to Khadija Mboe. The underlying message of some of these I don't dream of labor videos is that you can stop working a normal job by starting a YouTube page, but no, you can't. You can't just bottle this and sell it to other people. I don't care what they're saying in their thumbnail, but moreover, even when I do get that first YouTube check and get that first sponsor, understand that this won't be me fulfilling my dream job. For me, for a lot of black men, and not to humble brag, I'm already living my dream. I don't think historically many black people have dreamed of labor. Men playing at John Henry come in every race, of course, and hustlers come in every race in all shades. But for black men, when you see James Evans doing everything he can to keep the lights on in his house and keep his kids out of trouble, when you see Will Smith with his son sleeping in a bathroom as Chris Gardner in Pursuit of Happiness, like what people miss is that the dream isn't labor, it's this. It's the idea that their work and effort will create new opportunities for them, their families, and their children. When I heard this concept, the first thought that came to my brain is, if I don't labor, how will my children eat? And I immediately went to discussions with other black men that I've had about their ability to feed their children and how their lack of access to steady work impacts their mental health, their love lives, and of course, their ability to see their children. And like the craziest thing to me is that this popped up in the middle of the pandemic. And so 
no shade to most of these creators that make videos about this because I understand where it comes from. I'm, I, I maybe didn't do enough empathy for this video and I want to make sure that comes across that I get why. I could imagine being in my early to mid 20s, being single or at least not having children and like being done because I've been done. I get it. But so many people that don't dream of labor are not dreaming of labor while they labor at home. And in the middle of a pandemic, people that don't have a choice but to dream of labor were like considered essential and have been working, laboring in the middle of this shit for the last year and a half. And they're dying at a rate of three to one compared to us. The shit's just kind of tone deaf. Beyond that, what I hope is illustrated here is that the role and concept of work and labor is more complex than how it makes you feel to participate in capitalism. It's a meaningful theater of identity, especially for a lot of black men whose identity is directly connected to their capacity to work and how that work affects them, their families and their communities. I recognize that my criticisms regarding like needing to survive via work, that raising families and trying to get health care under capitalism is itself an indictment of the system. I get that, but that doesn't change the reality. Until I get a couple of thousand patrons, until I understand how this algorithm shit works and I can have every video hit like the Bro Burnham video hit, I'm gonna be working. As soon as my office says, come back to work, feet, two videos a month, not so much, cause I gotta eat. And that's where most people are at. So yeah, this one, this one's for the, the lifestyle ambassador branding YouTube space. This is not, at least not for me. This, this, this doesn't have enough seasoning on it. So yeah, y'all, that's all I got for this one. I hope this made sense. I hope you all like the new angle. It's nighttime. So we'll see if this ever makes the light of day. I don't know. I'm Feet the Signifier. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Please remember to do all the things I'm supposed to say at the end of the video. My Patreon and everything else is on the channel page. For some reason, YouTube won't allow me to post my Patreon in the section that pops up at the end of the video. So if you are interested, if you appreciate what I'm doing and you want to contribute, join the Patreon. It's on the channel page. That's it. That's all I got, y'all. Peace.